Hello, hello, wonderful to have you here. What I'd like to discuss today is the Buddha's pragmatism, one particular aspect of that having to do with certain kinds of ritual observances. Uh, one of the things that I love about early Buddhism and the Buddha's teaching in particular, and I think that many of us are attracted to, is the Buddha's relative pragmatism, his kind of down-to-earth way that he deals with our problems. What I think we'll find is that the Buddha's approach was largely empirical, where he preferred direct observation over intellectual speculations of certain kinds, at least in the main. And this kind of understanding of the Buddha's approach led to a concept which is probably, at least in a scholarly understanding, more associated with the 19th century or early mid-20th century of a kind of what we might term a scientific Buddha. That is, a Buddha who is really a kind of scientist. Now, this, uh, this understanding of the Buddha's teaching uh, has been recently ridiculed, I think, by a number of scholars, most prominently Donald Lopez in a recent book of his called The Scientific Buddha. Uh, I have a copy of it. Uh, unfortunately, in my house fire, it was damaged by smoke, and it's at the time I'm making this video, it's off being clean, so I don't have, I don't have it with me to, to cite. I'll leave a link to it down in the show notes. But the general idea is that, uh, that Don Lopez, who is a scholar of Buddhism, uh, has argued with a number of uh, examples how, in fact, if you look at the early texts, and indeed the, the texts in Buddhism in general, what you find is that the Buddha did, was indeed interested at times in more speculative, cosmological, even we might term metaphysical, although I don't particularly like that term in this context, but in any event, these kinds of claims. So, I'm, and, and frankly, I'm perfectly willing to grant a lot of that to Don Lopez. Um, he's right about that. But nevertheless, even having said that, there is a great wellspring of this kind of pragmatic, down-to-earth teachings that we can find in the early texts in particular. And so what I want to do is granting all of that uh, still make the case that there really is this kind of pragmatic Buddha that we can find in the early teachings and that's, that's worth discussing. And indeed that it's worth making the argument that such a, such a teaching does exist and can be found. Uh, and, and so that's what I'm going to do in this video. So what I want to do is to, is to show so, uh, many ways in which the Buddha was opposed to the more traditionally based sort of speculative ritualistic practices of his day, as well as the ways that the Buddha was uh, tended to demythologize many of the beliefs and practices of his day by taking a down-to-earth interpretation of many of the more, shall we say, highfalutin kind of speculative cosmological claims that were being made around him. Now, there's way too much in all of this for one video, so I, what I want to do is to split this into two videos. In today, I'll be dealing with more of the ritual aspects, and in the next video, I'll be dealing with some of the other aspects of the sort of demythologization and other kinds of related topics. Now, it's best to explain all of this with examples from the early texts. And so, in this video, I'll be talking about four particular examples of ritual practices and the Buddha's uh, negative kind of opinions about them. Some of these I've already discussed in prior videos, and so I'll leave links to those videos down below in the show notes if you want to hear more about each of these topics. So first, and indeed I did do a very recent video about this one, the Buddha was opposed to ritual bathing. Now, this kind of ritual, what's called ablutions, morning ablutions, or at least bathing at various times of the day, uh, in particular rivers, this was a common Brahminic practice of his day, and I believe it goes down even to the present day in India. There was a, this was an idea that by bathing oneself ritually, 
uh, one was able to clean off the sort of bad karma that had accumulated during one's life, and indeed to clean out one's mind by doing these kinds of ritual actions. The Buddha seems to have felt that such actions were ineffective, that they didn't really have any particular result to them. In, uh, in the, the video that I made a while back, I cited a number of texts, uh, but there's one text I didn't cite in that video, which I want to cite here, in, that, that in, the, in which the Buddha makes uh, very much the same point that I've just stated. He says, Purity doesn't come from water, no matter how many people bathe there. One who has truth and principle, they are pure, they are Brahmins. Now, the reason I chose this particular text is because it reinforces an idea that we're going to see again and again in these uh, two videos that I'm making here, which is that the Buddha time and again sort of reframes the whole notion of ritual action in terms of ethical action. That is to say, I should say, he, he reframes it, but he also substitutes ethical action for ritual action. So that if you might, one way to put it would be that if we're going to do rituals, those rituals should involve be acting ethically, acting with purity, acting with truth and principle, as he says in this passage. And as well, the Buddha is reframing what it is to be a Brahmin. To be a Brahmin, therefore, is not, as was commonly believed, to perform certain actions correctly, to perform the rituals properly, but instead to live an ethical life. The, the person who lived with truth, with principle, that was the true Brahmin, not the one who washed themselves properly in the ritual uh, fashion. Second, the Buddha didn't accept the common ritual practice of fire worship, which was once again something that was initiated uh, through the traditions of Vedic Brahmanism that came indeed from the Vedas. In uh, Vedic Brahmanism, there was the idea that one was supposed to keep certain sacred fires lit at all times and then make sacrifices into the fires. The Buddha, however, reframed the whole problem, the whole point of fire, as rather, or at least he did this in various ways in various suttas, but in some suttas, he framed the fire as an internal fire, which symbolized our greed, our hatred, our negative emotional states, and said that that fire should be quenched by our practice. So that is to say, instead of keeping the fires burning eternally, we were to quench the fires. So a reversal of the practice that was being suggested by the Brahmins of his day. Now, one very famous example of this we find in the Buddha's fire sermon, which is uh, the third sermon he was supposed to have given to anybody. Uh, we don't know really how correct that is, but at least that's the tradition. And in the fire sermon, it's once again suspected and, and said in the Vinaya that the Buddha was giving this sermon to a number of Vedic fire worshippers or Brahminic fire worshippers. So in other words, he wasn't simply giving a sermon on the, the ways that our greed and hatred was, was infused in all of our lives and burning us up from within. He wasn't giving that talk just to anybody, but he was giving it to people who worshipped fire and essentially telling them they shouldn't be worshipping the fire, they shouldn't be keeping the fires lit, but they should instead uh, be putting out their internal fires, that that was the true aim of the Brahmin, that was the true aim of the ascetic uh, person who was looking for liberation. In another early sutta, uh, the Buddha has a discussion with a Brahmin. Uh, this Brahmin was angry at the Buddha because the Buddha had apparently uh, uh, convinced his wife to become a follower of the Buddha. That is to say, the, Buddha, the, the, the Brahmin's wife had converted to Buddhism, and the Brahmin was uh, upset about that. And so the Brahmin decided to go to the Buddha to try to, he says, refute the Buddha's teaching. And when the Brahmin got there, uh, the Buddha instead uh, gave the Brahmin a discussion in which he again reframed the whole notion of fire worship, of Brahmanism. What the Buddha had to say is this. 
When what is incinerated do you sleep at ease? When what is incinerated is there no sorrow? When anger's incinerated you sleep at ease. When anger's incinerated there is no sorrow. O Brahman, anger has a poisoned root and a honey tip. Now, as I've just said, in the Brahmin fire worship, the Brahmins would uh, typically incinerate things in the sacred fires. But here, once again, the Buddha is reframing the whole notion of fire worship, essentially suggesting that the normal worship that the, that the Brahmins do is not effective, that instead what they should be looking to do is to incinerate their, their hatred, incinerate their greed, incinerate their delusions in the fire, that the incineration should be an internal incineration of, of unskillful mental states rather than an external incineration of particular objects in a fire. We see a similar kind of point made in a, an early poem by the monastic or the monk Nadi Kassapa. Uh, he, it was, this is one of the poems that's, that's uh, preserved in a book of early Buddhist poems by some of the first Buddhist monks. And in that poem, Nadi Kassapa says this. He says, I used to perform a diverse spectrum of sacrifices. I served the sacred flame, imagining this is purity. I was a blind, ordinary person, caught in the thicket of wrong view, deluded by misapprehension. Thinking impurity was purity, I was blind and ignorant. So Nadi Kasapa here says that he was, when he was a Brahmin performing these very rituals, he thought that impurity was purity. That is to say, that he thought that this fire ritual, this fire, these fire sacrifices, were an example of purity, of purifying oneself, of purifying various objects. But it was not. In the Buddha's understanding, and indeed in Nadi Kasapas at this point, these are examples of worldly aims, of worldly ends, of things that are done to get us a better life, but not done for the sake of true freedom. And that's why they should be set aside and substituted for other sorts of practices. Now, third, it may be unremarkable to say that the Buddha was opposed to blood sacrifices. Blood sacrifices were common in the Buddha's day uh, among the people that surrounded him. And indeed, it perhaps shouldn't be that... We shouldn't think of it as that, uns that, as that unsurprising because... Such rituals occur down to the present day in some societies. Uh, the Buddha was, nevertheless, uh, very, very strongly opposed to such kinds of ritual performances. Uh, in one example, the King Pasenadi, who was a king who was uh, very close to the Buddha in many ways, had uh, scheduled a large blood sacrifice, a sacrifice of many animals that were, it was supposed to be sacrificed, of course, to the to the benefit of the kingdom and the benefit of the people and the benefit of King Basanity himself. And when the Buddha heard about this, he essentially tried to dissuade King Basanity from doing such a thing. What he said was, horse sacrifice, human sacrifice, the sacrifices of the stick casting, the royal soma drinking, and the unbarred, now, I should say we don't really know what these sacrifices were, but presumably they involved blood. These huge violent sacrifices yield no great fruit. However, the Buddha goes on to say that such sacrifices in which blood is not spilled, where animals are not killed, are or can be of great fruit. Uh, that is to say, sacrifices of various kinds that, aren't, that don't involve literal killing, but that are uh, aimed towards the gods can be of great fruit. Now, this to an extent clashes with what I've just said about, or I should say Nadi Kasapa just said, uh, about uh, these sacrifices being impurity and not purity. We might say, well, but these sacrifices are examples of impurity as well, aren't they? They're not really purity. And I think the, perhaps the right way to look at this is that in this case with King Pasenadi, the Buddha is not, as we might say, letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. 
Uh, he pr presumably would prefer that King Basenadi not do sacrifices at all. I mean, they're not really all that important. They're for worldly ends and not for the ends of enlightenment. Nevertheless, if, if King Basenadi wants to help out his kingdom, perhaps he can do so by assuaging the gods, making certain kinds of non-blood sacrifices, and so the Buddha is sort of willing to countenance a, ben a worldly benefit if the king wants it, at least insofar as it's not going to harm anything. Now, fourth, the Buddha seems to have been somewhat averse to ritual homage in general, deity practices in general. Uh, one particularly famous example of this we find in the Sigalaka Sutta, which is uh, perhaps the most famous and extensive sutta where the Buddha gives advice to a layperson, Sigalaka. Basically, the Buddha goes on at, at, at quite a bit of length about how a layperson should be living their lives. And I did actually a course on, or I should say, I did a, several videos on this sutta in a course that I did over at the Online Dharma Institute on work, money, and pleasure, uh, where I discuss the Buddha's teaching to lay people, and I'll, I'll leave a link to that course down below in the notes in case you're interested. In any event, the sutta begins with this Brahman Sigalaka, who is involved in his morning ablutions, where he is revering the six directions, that is to say the four cardinal directions plus above and below. And it's believed that this, this kind of practice was a deity practice, that is to say that there were deities associated with each of these six directions, and that therefore this ritual was involved in propitiating each of these six deities every morning. And the Buddha sees Sigalaka doing this ritual, and essentially he noses in, which is something he didn't do that often, uh, but in this case he did. He sort of noses in and tells Sigalaka, well, look, you're doing the ritual in the wrong way. And that, of course, initiates a discussion about what the right way to perform such a ritual is. And the Buddha goes into a, an extensive, lengthy kind of discourse. I can't go into it all here. But essentially what the Buddha says is to, that the proper way to revere the six directions is to live ethically in various respects in one's life. So one's not actually revering six directions, but one is implicitly or metaphorically uh, uh, revering the six directions by living ethically. And that instead of revering a deity at each of these six directions, we should revere six types of people in our lives that are helpful to us such as our family, our close friends, our business associates, teachers, ascetics, such people as these. These are real people in our actual life uh, uh, rather than uh, deities that we uh, uh, assume are there and propitiate sort of in absentia without being able to see them. And so in this way, what the Buddha does essentially is to reframe a deity practice by removing the deities from it, at least overtly, and substituting for the deities people, important people in our lives, and important ethical practices that we can do right here and right now. In another early sutta, the Buddha essentially gives us a list of ritualistic or reverential practices that he, he believes are not particularly useful, and that, that, that therefore should be essentially discarded or substituted for by other more useful kinds of, of, of practices. Here he says, Imagine that just by going naked, by wearing dust and dirt, by immersing in water, by staying at the root of a tree, by staying in the open air, by standing continually, by eating at set intervals, reciting scriptures, by having matted hair, someone with covetousness, ill will, irritability, hostility, disdain, contempt, jealousy, stinginess, deviousness, deceit, bad desires, and wrong view could give up these things. If that were the case, your friends and colleagues, relatives and kin would make you do these as soon as you were born. That is to say, the Buddha here is arguing that such ritualistic or reverential practices are not really useful on their own, 
and so therefore that they should not be made the exclusive focus of one's practice. Now, to be clear, the Buddha did suggest that his followers sit by the roots of trees, he suggested that they ate at fixed intervals, and he suggested that they would recite scripture, but these were for particular more pragmatic ends of, let's say, having shade when you meditated, of not eating too much, of memorizing and remembering the Dharma. They were not for their own ends, shall we say. And these are various ways in which, again, the Buddha reframes the problem, brings the problem in that the, to say that the rituals themselves are not important as rituals. They may be important in various respects for our lives, but not because they're simply a traditional way of doing things. Now, in my next video, I'm going to go over several more of these examples, and when that video is ready, I'll put a link to it up here on the screen. Thanks so much for watching. If you're getting something out of these videos, uh, consider uh, joining us over at my Patreon page, which is linked down below, and seeing if you want to help support the channel. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next one, and meanwhile, all of you, be well.